Pure Libertarian's daily podcast. I'm your host, Hody Johns, and I am joined today by the Libertarian Party Executive Director, Daniel Fishman. Daniel, how are you today? I'm excited. Thanks so much for having me, Cody. Yeah, uh, great to have you on, man. So so let's let's get right out with it. Uh, what does the Executive Director do? So I am essentially the Chief Operating Officer for the Libertarian Party uh, I make sure that the bills get paid, that the lights stay on. I try to uh, make sure that everything about us as a party and operation is running as professionally and as efficiently as possible. Okay, fantastic. So somebody has to be the guy uh, making everything click, making sure the bills are paid on time, and that's you. Exactly. And so a lot of that has to do with sort of identifying what our tasks are supposed to be, executing on the mission, and then identifying the next mission, moving on to that. So as an example, things I've done in the last week <clears throat> have included supporting ballot access in Texas and in Georgia, both of which are facing, uh, Texas has a terrible bill in Congress right now, and we're trying to figure out ways that we can influence their state legislature. And in Florida, they, or sorry, in Georgia, they have a lawsuit about uh, ballot access. Georgia actually has the worst ballot access in the country. No third party candidate, no libertarian has been elected in over 50 years because you have to have 20 percent of the uh, registered voters to get on the ballot. So Georgia's filing a lawsuit. We feel they've got a really good chance to win. Uh, we were able to help out in a bunch of different ways that we're sort of putting the resources of the National Party behind them. Gotcha. Now, if I recall correctly, just from following the last election, wasn't there a there was a republic or there was a libertarian in that Georgia race for governor, wasn't there? Or am I mistaken on that? I thought it was Metz. Uh, well, I think you're correct because right now it was the big Stacey Abrams race, right. and uh, in the end, she had a uh, she lost by however much, and definitely the libertarian was greater than the uh, margin of victory. But it was a uh, big it is a big issue in Georgia for them to get candidates on the ballot. They have to work really, really hard. And so it shouldn't be like that. It should be easier. In fact, in Georgia, most of the races go uncontested. Mm -hmm. So finding a way for a libertarian to, uh, be, for the libertarian party to be more competitive. One of the arguments we make, we made this argument in Texas as well, you know, in tyranny, tyrannical countries uh, with dictators around the world, you see these sham elections where, you know, yep. last one I remember Ahmed Dinejad got elected by 98% or Putin got elected by a few votes, something like that. <laughs> sure. But they have these sort of sham candidates. And really what's happening right now is that the Republicans and Democrats, they no longer represent actual parties with positions. They represent position and opposition. So what happens is that whatever position one party takes, the other party takes the opposite position. And what's worse is that you know, somebody, and I keep forgetting who made the quote, somebody said, the business of America is business. We have become really good at every business thing that we take. So we know how to streamline making cars. We know how to make computers. We know how to do things so well that we ship it off to other countries and let them build it while we invent the next thing. We have become really good at winning elections and the Republicans and the Democrats are experts at it. And what they've realized is that the best way for them to keep winning elections is to make sure that the two of them are the only ones that have access to the voters. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to campaign for a candidate each time, that becomes cumbersome, right? Because you have all these new candidates, you have to come up with new campaigns. It's easier to demonize the other side because the other side is always the bad guy. And so what the country, yeah, exactly, what they've done now is that they have demonized it so much that the country is split right and left and they're afraid to vote for anybody else I'll tell you a little story from my campaign i ran for auditor in massachusetts last year i had uh, what i thought was a very compelling case i said you know the auditor is supposed to make sure that the government doesn't waste money why would you elect a republican or a democrat to audit republicans and democrats sure. and yeah it made a lot of sense so i was speaking to a group of voters in wellesley massachusetts super democratic thing but i wanted to go everywhere and i can tell when i'm speaking to people whether or not i'm actually resonating with them they loving everything that i say i can tell they're like yes yes so that makes sense i you know one of the things i said was as a computer scientist i'm gonna put all the books online all the time so people can see how the money spent everybody loves that idea at the end one of the women's one of the women stood up and she said dan i love everything that you had to say 
I think you would be an amazing auditor. But the party has told me that if I don't vote blue all the way down the ticket, that that shows weakness in the Democratic Party, and that allows Donald Trump to build the wall. And people stood up and started clapping. And that's when I realized the Republicans and the Democrats have succeeded in polarizing us so much. And it didn't used to be like that. And that's well, that was one of the things that really compelled me to come and work and bring my skill set to the Libertarian Party, because I want us to not be like that. I want us to be the America where we recognize the fact that we live together. You know, one of the things that I, I'm speeching, I'm speechifying here too much, but oh, go ahead. <laughs> Let me finish this last, this last idea. You know, I'm sure my listeners are very tired of my voice, so they appreciate anything you have to say. Go ahead. Well, one of the things, you know, I think that is so amazing about the way that uh, things work in the United States is that we have all these religious communities that live together in peace. And nobody has an expectation that you would live under the rules of my religion, right? That would be incredible. We wouldn't expect Christians, don't expect Muslims to follow their rules. Jewish people don't expect, uh, you know, Hindus to follow their rules. But why do we expect, the Democrats expect Republicans to have to live under their rules? What happened? And we said, okay, you know, this went, uh, you know, there's a, a, a great libertarian out in California named Chris Rufer who talks about the idea that you can be as Republican as you want. You can be as Democrat as you want. You can be whatever party you want. We encourage you to do that, just don't make us live under your rules. You want to form democratic economy and stuff like that, that's where we're going. And so that's that's part of why I came here, to hope, help get that message out. Sure. How good are your ideas if you have to mandate them, right? <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. that's uh, that, that's kind of the, the general mantra. Uh, the business of America is business quote, I believe, is uh, Calvin Coolidge, and he's a great libertarian uh, esque president to, uh, to quote. Yeah, back when... Uh, Back when Massachusetts loved laissez-faire, boy, that's a long time ago, the 1920s. Eh? But, uh, but yeah, so so what are some of the best ways that y you're talking about pushing back, and I'm loving it. So physically, what's some of the best ways that we can push back against that system? I, I, either you and your position, or how would you like to see libertarians help? Uh, I just, for me, it just seems so futile to, to watch this tennis game go back and forth. And I wonder, well, how can we get involved to break up that, that uh, two-party monotony of position? And uh, I, I like what you said, yeah. the uh, position and opposition. Because really, right. I mean, the wall is a social program, right? You wouldn't think you'd see uh, Republicans all over social programs, but right. the Democrats hate it. So, hey, I guess we love a social program if you're the, on the right, you know, just crazy stuff like that. Right. That's all that they represent at this point in time. So yeah. one of the things that I think is critical is the way that we, because really, we are the party of opposition, yeah. and we should understand how critical that is, what a sacred place that is to be, because the party of the opposition is the one who's always standing up for the rights of the people, because the people who are always in opposition against the state are the individuals. We are the ones who represent their rights, and we've been fighting for them now for, you know, since 1971, since the formation of the Libertarian Party. And the Libertarian Party is the only political arm of the liberty movement. You know, there's a lot of different great liberty forces out there, Reason and Cato and Atlas, all those guys. But we're the only ones who are working at it from a political standpoint. And so what we've got to do is recognize the fact that the voice of the opposition, when we speak up for that, we are speaking for this idea. You know, Ayn Rand is sometimes a controversial figure, but she had this idea, she said, the individual is the ultimate minority. I like to rephrase that a little bit. I say, that we are all actually minorities of one. And we recognize that there's something about us that is different. As a like, fellow so, white man, I feel a lot hipper knowing that I'm a minority, you know. It's, but, it's but you are, because there's something about you, you know, I, I would say that being a podcaster makes you a minority, but I actually suspect there are more podcasters and people listening to podcasts now. <laughs> it might be true at this point. <laughs> but I do think that there's a uh, there's a real truth to the fact that we rec we represent the minority, but the minority owner shifts. When you say you are a minority of one, the greatest thing that's out there is this sense of intersectionality. You know, the Democrats feel like they've claimed this word, intersectionality. But in reality, libertarians, we should own that because there are things about the libertarian platform that appeal to everybody. And that's not true about any other platform. Everybody can find something in the libertarian platform, whether like 
yeah, you know what? Absolutely, that is part of what I'm talking about. And that is a really important thing because when we find the things that unite us, that's so different than the political environment in our country right now. You know, I talked earlier about how the Republicans and Democrats are so focused at polarizing the country, mm -hmm. at deliberately splitting us up. And it's in our name. We're not supposed to be like that. We are supposed to be states united, okay? Not states unified. We're not supposed to have one opinion. And we're not supposed to rule with the tyranny of the majority. You get 51%, we're not supposed to we're not supposed to push that out on other people. Instead, what we should be doing is saying, here we are. Liberty is the birthright of all people. And liberty means that there's tolerance involved in everything that we do. Liberty and tolerance are two sides of the same point. When you practice your liberty, you can only do it if everybody else tolerates it. Because if they don't, they have the ability to stop you, right? 10 people can stop one person from doing something that's not right but you depend on other people's tolerance in order to be able to exercise your liberty. So when we practice tolerance ourselves, and, and also recognize the fact, tolerance is not saying, it's okay for you to do stuff that I approve of. Tolerance is specifically saying, you can do stuff that I don't approve of, but I don't have the right to stop you from doing that. In Massachusetts, I used to say all the time, people would tell me all the time how tolerant they were in Massachusetts. And I said, well, you think you're tolerant because you support marriage equality, but everybody in Massachusetts supports marriage equality. Show me that you are tolerant by telling me you support somebody else's Second Amendment rights, because that's something that you don't agree with. I'm like, oh, I don't do that. And I'm like, then you're not tolerant. Accept that about yourself. And th that would make them think. And that's what we have to do is recognize the fact that every one of us has something about us that is different, freaky, whatever it is. Somewhere we've all got that thing inside of us recognizing that that is the intersectionality that we have, that we are all minorities of one, that's the thing that brings us together. And that's the message that the Libertarian Party has to get out. Yeah, great. You know, I, I, I completely agree, and I've said this often. We had a booth at the, uh, at the Pride Festival, and it was a great experience, and our booth ended up being very popular. And one of the things was the message we got out there. Of course, the Republicans did not have a booth. They opted to skip it. Um, okay. Yeah, no surprise there. The Democrats yeah. were there, but the Democrats were championing this idea of we'll give you permission to get married. And we were championing right. the idea of no one should have to give you that permission. As soon as you've got your hands out and you're begging for it, you've lost the fight because as soon as somebody else is in charge, you're going to lose that right. It's the same. Yeah. It's similar to make it, you know, to give to put it on the right wing. You know, you've got the Democrats who says you, who say you don't have the right to protect yourself mm -hmm. however you want. You got the Republicans who say we'll let you have defend yourself in most ways, and then Libertarians which say uh, I think you're in charge of that and not the government telling you how you should be able to defend yourselves. And so really it isn't, we, we, we kind of phrase ourselves as socially left and uh, economically right, but that's really not accurate because we transcend both of them in the sense that you shouldn't be asking for permission. Yeah, you're 100% right. And that's one of the things that kills me all the time is that, you know, Republicans and Democrats and, and people who fall into the trap of believing that our parties are defining our politics, believe that politics is a number line. To the right are the Republicans, and beyond that is the state controlling everything. To the left are the Democrats. Sorry, beyond the right is the Republicans, beyond that are corporations controlling everything. To the left are Democrats, and beyond that is the state controlling everything. But that's not true. Politics is not two-dimensional. Politics is three-dimensional. And that third direction, that third dimension, that's up. And that's the direction of personal liberty. Uh, you know, Dr. King said, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. And the truth of it is that all we have to do in order to be able to exercise our liberty is to be willing to stand up together. If we stand up for liberty, things will change. Cannabis, that is not a right issue or a left issue. That is an up issue. It's a liberty issue. Marriage equality is not a right issue or a left issue. It's an up issue. We are about standing up together. You know, you think about our heritage as a country. We stand up for the idea that you know, no taxation without representation. Government shouldn't have these powers. You know, and, and the Constitution is such a unique document because it specifically says that government shall not, in, shall not uh, make laws, shall not infringe on the rights of the people. The people have the rights. They're not given to them by government. Government is specifically forbidden from infringing them. 
we recognize that part and we recognize that we all have these equal rights that is a critical element of us waking up yeah the uh and and i feel like americans are becoming more and more open to these ideas um it's a slow process i mean gary johnson pulled in 3.8 percent which was more than any libertarian candidate had done before that but still very low by most people's taste but i think as soon as we get things like the drug war, people are kind of slowly waking up and realizing libertarians were right about that all along. And I think, you know, criminal justice is probably the next domino to fall there. It's hard to say. I mean, the libertarians have so many issues that they're right on. I mean, I'm a libertarian. You're a libertarian. That's why we're talking about this. But right. But yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and that level of intersectionality, you know, we have all these things that we're right on. And sometimes where we go wrong is what our me- where our messaging tries to say not to find all the things that we agree with people that we're right on, mm-hmm. but to find out to other people all the things that they're wrong on. Right. And anybody who does that misses is probably remem- misremembering the part in their past when they were wrong. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you, there's so much in my past where I made was wrong about certain things. There's a, uh, a great guy, libertarian, you should have him on your show, his name is Jim Bouchard, wrote a book called Crazy Angry Libertarian. And in it, he has this one sentence here. He says, I did not become a libertarian. I discovered that I was one. And that's, I think, the truth for most of us. We find one issue where we're like, yeah, you know, that's where I think the libertarians are right. That's where the liberty issue is right. And then you start thinking about it. say, you know what? If I expect people to respect my liberty in this issue, then I have to respect their liberty in that issue. And, you know, there are things that libertarians advocate for that I kind of, you know, at times I'm like, I think there's a better way that we can do it, but I have to respect their liberty and let them do things that way. So the best thing I can do then is try to advocate in a voluntaristic way, you know, maybe you can make a better decision with what you're doing with your money or something like that. But I'm not going to say I'm going to make a law that says I'm going to take 4% of your earnings and put into a lockbox so that you have money in your retirement not going to do that we're not going to use force to do those sort of things even though we know right i mean everybody who thinks about it knows of course you should be saving for the day that you are so old and tired that you can't earn any money anymore it makes sense to do that rather than being a burden and have an enjoyable retirement and i think anybody who has any sense is doing that but when we have the scenario where you know right now right and left are all about we're going to do things our way we're going to make you do what we want to do we're going to use a very small majority to do it that's where our importance as the libertarian party is becoming critical because we're the only ones who are speaking consistently on any issue the republicans and democrats circle all the time (coughs) excuse me there are various points a lot of issues you can look at filibuster is a great one right 2013 the republicans are like Don't get rid of the filibuster. And the Democrats are like, well, you won't pass Obama's judges, so we're going to get rid of the filibuster. Republicans are like, don't do it, don't do it. The filibuster is a really important critical component to our democracy. They got rid of it for judges. And then, of course, 2017, they want to get uh, Gorsuch through, and the Democrats won't let him with, you know, 41 votes. And they say, well, you know, we're going to get rid of the filibuster. So position and opposition, whoever's the party in power, they just want to make the rules. Our consistent platform is that we are opposing any laws that restrict people's liberties. So we're always on the side of the minority. And when the Republicans and Democrats, the people, not the parties, when the people realize that, that's the revolution that we're looking for. We're looking for people to wake up and recognize the fact that we have a, we're in a compact with all of humanity. And the best expression of that is that when we engage in that compact by honoring and respecting each other's choices, that's how we facilitate liberty best. Honoring and respecting everybody else to make their own choice. Even when we think we're making bad ones, we have to honor the fact that they've done it. Yeah, it, it, it's... Uh... And it feels great. I think once you start, you're not judging people and, and people feel so much better and more comfortable around mm-hmm. you. You touched on this and this is kind of something I, I know we've only got a few more minutes, but something that I wanted to ask you about. And since you've touched on it and you've mentioned this in your history, just some good evangelistic techniques for getting 
left wingers, right wingers to start thinking up as opposed to left and right. What are some tools or advice that you would have for somebody who's saying, man, I love liberty. I'm trying to help my friends love liberty as well. What What are some good tips that you have so, for them? So the key is to understand, to listen first. Listen to what they're saying because you listen to what they're saying, you're going to come up with a libertarian story that makes complete sense that you can bring into that. Now, I'll give you a great example. We went to, in Massachusetts, on tax day, we have, you know, they had the original Tea Party as a tax rebellion in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. On tax day, we would all gather down at the Parkman bandstand. Uh, it was thrown by the, it was in the Boston Common. Great tradition there of speaking out against taxation. And so we went for years uh, and we would speak against taxes and all the things that were wrong with it. And then after Trump was elected, the Tea Party that had thrown it stopped throwing the party. And instead there was a resistance tax day rally held at Cambridge Common which, you know, that's, that is the heart of the liberal left. But we were invited. And I'm like, I'm going. And a lot of my friends are like, well, here you want to go there? There are going to be a lot of angry people there, angry about, you know, the president. And they might get mad at you. I'm like, if we're not willing to bring the message, then we shouldn't even, we shouldn't try to advocate for it. So I went there and I came up with a very simple message. I said, here's the thing. You guys are probably worried about violence in our society and especially police violence that's happening right now. We see it all across the country. But here's a simple truth. Laws require law enforcement, and that's what injects force into our society. So let's talk about some of the stupid laws that have ended up resulting in force. There are these two girls in Dallas, Texas, who wanted to sell lemonade, and police rolled up, uh, you don't have a license. Lucky for them, a reporter stopped, came by, and said, oh, what was happening? And the oldest girl, said to the reporter, please tell everybody that tomorrow we are going to be giving away lemonade and accepting donations for my dad's birthday party. And so, of course, right, it's not illegal to give away lemonade. Another great example is that there was, a, and this one's not as happy, there's a guy in Florida who was feeding the homeless, okay? He's a 90-year-old guy, saw the homeless out there in Boca Raton, came out with his grill, a lot of food, started feeding people. The police said, oh, we don't want that to happen. In fact, the city passed a law because they felt like he was bringing more homeless into the town because they could get fed. He's like, but they're getting fed. This is my responsibility. And they arrested him, a 90-year-old guy to jail for that. But where it becomes tragic is Eric Garner. So uh, a lot of people know the story. I don't want to make it seem like Eric Garner was a saint. He was a hustler. He was a guy who found a way to make money left and right, legal, illegal, not necessarily. He didn't really care. He was making money. But he didn't hurt people. Every day at the end of his day, he would go into his local bodega, buy a pack of cigarettes, and come out and sell them loose. So New York City, pack of cigarettes is $14. Sells 20 cigarettes, make 20 bucks, go back in, $6 profit. He would buy a chicken or a hamburger or something, go upstairs, cook dinner for his six kids. The police had a couple times seen him, said, hey, you can't do that, you can't sell loose cigarettes. One day they're like, you know what? We're arresting you, we're taking you downtown. He's like, guys, look, here's the cigarettes. Here's the money. I can't be arrested. I got six kids upstairs, please. Like, no, we're going to take you downtown. You got to go with us. It's like, I can't go. And then the police were done talking. Guy grabbed him from behind and put him in a chokehold. They took him down to the ground. And then he said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And they said, if you can talk, you can breathe. And then he stopped talking. And then he was dead. And he was dead because of this stupid law. How can it be illegal to sell something that you can give away for free? Right, this guy, all he's trying to do is make a little bit of money so that he can feed his family. Laws require law enforcement, and that injects force to our society. So if we want a more peaceful society, if we want something that bonds us all together, then let's figure out a way to get rid of some of these stupid laws that are actually betraying the best law enforcement officers who are out there, who are being forced to enforce these stupid laws. And so that's how I reach a bunch of Democrats at this place. Right. That's the sort of thing about it. You can craft a libertarian message to go to everybody. Pick the thing, the message that's going to resonate with them, because that's what you're supposed to do. We are supposed to be right. The torch of liberty. We are sparking the fire everywhere we go. you got to know how to do it, though. And you got to practice it, too. So my advice to anybody who wants to go out there and do libertarian activism is for us to make sure that you are going to do the best job you can. Because, you know, Nick Sarwark said this once. We don't want to ruin anybody's first impression with liberty. 
We don't want to be the person who says, oh, libertarianism, that's not for me. So practice, practice with your friends. Maybe not practice so much on Facebook, but practicing having these political conversations in a way that you can communicate and not get angry, that really makes a difference. Yeah, you're talking about your friends warning you about a hostile environment. I was like, have they been on Facebook? I mean, that's that's about as hostile <laughs> as it gets, right? If you right, can handle exactly. that, you'll be okay. Awesome. Well, uh, here at the We Are Libertarians, we like to give everybody a, a last word and just kind of a wrap up. Uh, if uh, if you want to just uh, close by telling the world uh, exactly what sure. you do, what you stand for, and anything else that you think we may have missed. Give me a number and I'll hit it. How long do you want me to go? You've Two got... Minutes? No, I would say you've got a solid five minutes. Solid five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah. All right. So uh, I came to Washington with a very specific plan. Got four things in it. The most important thing for the Libertarian Party is that we increase our impact on the country. We do that in four ways. The first and most important way is increasing membership. And so a lot of people who haven't been members of the Libertarian Party or walked away, or you're members of your state party, you're not members of national. Becoming a member of national party is a big deal because when you do that, it allows us to show various politicians, various editors, stuff like that, these are our numbers. We can disclose them and say, you know what, we've got 10,000 members here. We got 15,000 members there, whatever it is. Showing the increase in membership, in addition to the fact, you know, you're giving us a little bit of money so that we can go work for ballot access in Georgia, or ballot access in Texas, or the rights of sex workers in uh, various places where they're being threatened right now, all sorts of things. Be becoming a member makes a big difference for stuff like that. But also when you're a member, you're showing people that libertarianism is growing. You can talk about that. I'm a member of the Libertarian Party. And that's the thing. We show that we're growing because we are the fastest growing party in the United States. Mm -hmm. You stepping up and becoming a part of that, that continues to happen. Step two, fundraising. You know, this is a, a very simple thing. Money is the mother's milk of politics. And I ran for Congress in 2012, and I decided to fund my own campaign. That's a stupid thing to do. But I did it. Well, it, it, it is. But I did it because the worst thing you can possibly do, right, the thing that you hate the most is to ask other people for money. However, I realized in, this, in the 2012 campaign, when I didn't ask people for money, I was telling them that I didn't think my campaign was worth anything. No money, worthless, no value. When you ask people for money, you're sh telling them that your issue is so important that you're willing to do the worst thing possible and go out and ask for it. And so as much as I hate doing that, that's part of my job right now. And I ask people, I say, I need more fundraisers. I need people to come in because it's going to make a big difference for you to, to, for you to do that thing. The third thing I really want to do is I want to enhance the state affiliates. Okay, Some states are in great shape. Some states need a lot of help, and states, you know who you are. We need to have a, we need to have the states grow because all politics is local. As the state parties grow in power, as they grow in professionalism, we're going to be better across the board. We can model that a little bit at the national party, and so we're going to work very hard to become very professional. And that's specifically what I bring. I have a long professional background and worked in the software industry for a while uh, before that. I was a special education teacher. Uh, I can bring that, the professionalism that's required to complete tasks. We're gonna start doing that at the national level, and then we're gonna lend that out, <clears throat> excuse me, to the states and the affiliates. And then the, <clears throat> the last thing is we have to have more visibility, more public appearances. And that actually is a doable thing. You can execute a plan and get people on television. Part of what my goal is going to be is I'm going to get Nick Sarwar on television because I think he's the best spokesman we have for the party right now. Getting him on in various places helps our message to get out. And it's not going to be Nick. Nick's going to be the model. But then I want to see the state chairs doing it in their local places. I want to see, you know, in North Carolina, I want to see Susan Hogarth talking to the media about libertarian issues, about political issues, representing the idea of what's going on. I want to see Jim Rosenbeck in New York talking about what's happening. Jeff Lyons in Massachusetts. I wish I could name more state chairs. Uh, Mimi Robson in California. Uh, John Watts in Alaska. I want to see those state chairs emulating what we're doing at National, getting better press, 
better media and getting libertarian ideas in front of the mainstream. Because when we do that, it really makes a difference. So that's four and a half minutes. You did great. At least you gave me time to uh, to wrap things up here. All right. Hey, Daniel, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. Uh, Absolutely. Guys, I, I really just wish there were more uh, libertarians like Daniel, and he's doing a good job making more great libertarians like unto himself, or he would probably say like unto themselves, making a whole bunch of, uh, of just individuals who, who value that, who value uh, other people's freedoms as well as their own. But uh, I appreciate the, you getting the message out there. I actually didn't know what to expect. I was like, oh, man, this guy recently just got a big fat promotion. Do, does he want to talk about his promotion or just uh, you know, just, just being really it, important? Well, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I, I'm very happy to be here. Mm-hmm. But it is I, – I walked away from being a very successful software engineer in Boston, Massachusetts. I mean, I came here. This is the biggest donation I can make to the Libertarian Party. I am here specifically because I believe in the cause – and I want to make things happen. That's the dedication that we're all going to have to put into this. Awesome. I love your revolutionary attitude, my friend. So uh, <laughs> everybody, uh, keep fueling the fires of liberty. Uh, please support the show. Patreon. You see it on your screen. Patreon.com slash We Are Libertarians. Help keep us afloat. And, of course, make your donations to the Libertarian Party if you really want to see us grow. Dan, thanks again. My pleasure. <laughs>